Hi, welcome back. In this session, I'd like to talk about the fine line that separates perception from reality, illusion from fact in the market by looking at two phenomena, stock splits and index inclusions or exclusions. Let me set the stage. Yesterday was a big day for markets. Big day in what sense? There were two big news stories that hit markets. This was August 31st. The first was that Tesla and Apple, two of the most widely followed stocks in the world, would have stock splits. Apple would split four for one, four shares for every share you owned, and Tesla five for one. In addition, the Dow 30, a hopelessly flawed index, but one that's widely followed, announced that three stocks that had been in the, in the index for a while, Exxon Mobil, Pfizer and Raytheon, would be replaced with three new stocks, Honeywell, Salesforce and Amgen. And of course, the markets went crazy and investors reacted. Market gurus came in with explanations for why investors were reacting. And as I sat back and looked at these events, the question I was asking was, what is the effect of a stock split? Why does including a stock in an index change the stock? So to make sense of these events, here's what I went back to. I went back to a distinction I've drawn for a long time between value and price. Words we use interchangeably, but we shouldn't. What drives value? Cash flows, growth and risk. We've known this for centuries. What drives price? Demand and supply. What drives demand and supply? Well, it could be cash flows, growth and risk, but more often than not, it's mood and momentum. It's group thinking, the herd mentality that drives stocks and liquidity. And almost every investment philosophy that you see out there takes a point of view about the price and the value and the gap between the two. If you're a true value investor, for instance, you believe that value and price can be different. And when they're different, that price over time will converge on value. So what do you do? You buy something that is cheap, where the price is less than the value, then you wait until the price converges on value. It might or might not happen. If you're a trader, you have little interest in value. You play the pricing game. What does that mean? You try to detect what the momentum is, you climb on, and you detect when shifts are coming and you climb off. And finally, if you're a believer in efficient markets, you too agree that the pricing process and the value process can give different numbers, but what you believe is that investors don't have the capacity to detect A, which direction the gap is in and when it'll close, that you can't make money off the gap. Every investment philosophy can be seen through the prism of the price versus value contrast. I'm going to take the contrast between price and value and use it to classify events. What do I mean? Every event you see out there, whether it's an event precipitated by the company, a buyback, a stock issuance, an acquisition, or by a regulator or a government, or by the Fed, can be classified into one of three groups. It can be a value event. What, can, what do value events do? They change the cash flows or the expected growth or the risk in a particular set of cash flows. And by doing it, they change value. So value events change value. Pricing events, on the other hand, change mood and momentum. They change liquidity. And by doing so, they change the price. And finally, there are gap events. Gap events do nothing for value, but they draw attention to a company that is undervalued, where the price is different from the value or overvalued, the price is higher than the value. And by drawing attention to the company, they cause the gap to close. Every event you see out there can be put into one of these three groups. Now, before I go further though, there are very few pure events. In other words, it can be a primary reason for an event, but there are secondary factors that kick in. Let me give you an example. When a manufacturing company builds a new factory, when a retailer opens a new store, the event is primarily a value event because it will affect the cash flows, growth and risk, even by a small amount, buy that amount and change value. But because these events tend to be under the radar, viewed as part of the regular operation of the company, you almost never open up the paper that's and see a read Home Depot opens new store. That's not done. But because it's under the radar, it tends to not have an effect on the pricing gap or on pricing per se. But let me give you two more subtle examples where you can have spillover effects. A couple of weeks ago, Walmart and Microsoft announced that they were going to form a partnership to buy the U.S. operations for TikTok. Now, Microsoft's presence there was not a surprise, but Walmart's was. And if you are an investor in Walmart, think of what you would read into that announcement. The first is there is a value effect. This is not going to be a cheap acquisition. It's going to be in the tens of billions. 
that'll mean there's going to be a cash outflow right now. That's the bad news. The good news, though, is maybe TikTok will deliver growth and potential benefits in the future that exceeds that 10 billion. There's a value effect. But there's also side effects, right? By doing this, by Walmart going out and buying TikTok, it might be changing momentum in the market. Why? Because there are investors out there excited about tech stocks who have avoided Walmart, viewing it as, a, as an old-time retail company. Maybe they'll jump onto the stock. It might or might not happen, but there could be a pricing effect. Here's another example. A few weeks ago, a California court decided that Uber and Lyft, in fact, all ride-sharing companies, would have to treat their drivers as employees, not as independent contractors. Is there a value effect? Absolutely. Because if these ride-sharing companies have to treat their drivers as employees, their cost structure changes. They've got to come up with health care benefits and maybe side costs that reflect the fact that these drivers are employees. There's a value effect. But it could also have an effect on the gap to the extent that this court action could cause investors to go back and take another look at the value and price for these companies. Maybe there are some investors who look at you know, Lyft and Uber and say, hey, you know what, maybe we got the value, maybe we got the price wrong, maybe we should lower the price of these companies. So all I'm saying is while these events might primarily be value events, there are side benefits can be either gap effects or pricing effects. Let's look at events that are primarily or mostly gap events. And then remember in a gap event, the value of the company doesn't change, but the price can change because people's attention is drawn to the company. The purest example I can think for a gap event is a multi-business company that decides to break itself up. Because what you're basically doing is you're taking the same business, it continues to be run the same way after the spin-off or split up as it was before. But the act of spinning off or splitting off can create a gap event. And here's why. One is when you do the spin-off or split off, you might make more transparent the disconnect there is, at least that you perceive to be, between price and value. You say, look, look at my cash flows of the business I've spun off. Why are you underestimating value? The other is you're going to be in the news. And for better or worse, that attention might draw people to see that you are, in fact, undervalued. No guarantee it'll work, but that's, that's the primary motive. Now, the other, uh, the other example I would give for a gap event has, doesn't originate with the company. It originates with an outsider. When a Carl Icahn or a Bill Ackman targets a company and the news gets out, what happens? The stock price jumps. Notice that the very fact that they've targeted and invested in the company hasn't changed the way the company is run. The initial effect of an activist investor investing in a company is that if there's a gap between price and value, it closes. Now, of course, there could be subsequent effects where these activist investors push for changes that can change the value of a company. Again, a mixed effect, but the primary effect is a gap event. Let's talk about pricing events. Pricing events, the end game is not changing value. It's not even about the gap. It's about changing the mood and momentum around a stock or changing the liquidity in a stock. Again, let me give you a simple example. Let's say you're an emerging market company and you choose to list your stocks in a developed market index. The act of listing hasn't changed your company, right? You're still the same company, the same cash flows, the same growth, the same risk. But when you list on another exchange, there could be a pricing effect for two reasons. One is the index you list on, the exchange you list on, the developed market exchange you might list on might have more liquidity. That higher liquidity could help you push up your price. There can also be spillover effects from the fact that when you list on a developed market exchange, your information disclosure requirements might change. And that inf information disclosure might, might make investors feel more comfortable in, about investing in you, which makes you a less risky company. But the primary effect here could, is, in fact, the pricing effect. So the big question we face then with stock splits and index inclusions is, is where would you put them? Before I look at stock splits and index inclusions, so I have to note that there are some events where depending on the company doing it or depending on who does it, and the motives for doing it, you could put it into one of the three buckets. My favorite example for this is buybacks. If you ask me, are buybacks value events, gap events, or pricing events? My answer it depends on who's doing the buyback and why they're doing it. Give me three examples. If you are a company that buys back stock and you borrow money to buy back stock, you might be intent on changing your debt ratio and changing your cost of funding. In fact, we know that cost of capital can change when you change your debt ratio. Your effect is a value effect. 
So if your primary reason for a buyback is a one-time change in your debt ratio to get it closer to where you think it should be, it's a value effect. If you're buying your stock because you feel it's undervalued, remember Berkshire Hathaway famously avoided buybacks for a long time until a few years ago when they enunciated that their rule on buybacks would be that they would buy back stock, but only if they believe their stock was trading below its intrinsic value. Now, most companies, when they say this, your reaction is right. You don't know what the intrinsic value is. But because Berkshire Hathaway has the backing of Warren Buffett, people believed it. And to the extent that you believe it, you could argue that buying back stock here is a gap effect. You're doing it because you think the value is higher than the price. And finally, there are companies. And let's be cynical. A lot of companies buy back stock because everybody else is doing it or to change the momentum on the company or to provide put protection. Basically, they say, we'll buy back stock to protect you on the downside. They're doing it for the wrong reasons, I guess, but they're doing it to change the pricing momentum, to keep the pricing going up. So depending on who's doing it, buybacks can be value effects, can have value effects, gap effects, or pricing effects as their dominant effects. So now let's look at stock splits and index inclusions to see where we should put them. And especially in the context of the stock splits and the index changes on August 31st of 2020. Let's start with stock splits. In one of the earliest studies in academic finance in 1969, Farmer Fisher, Jensen and Rowe, forever rolled into one title as FFJR, looked at stock splits, one of the first studies of an event. And what they looked at was stock prices leading into a stock split and what happened afterwards. The question they were asking was, what happens in the market after a stock split? And their findings were not surprising. They found that stock splits tended to be after periods where stock prices had gone up a lot. And then their conclusion, they found that at least on average, if you looked at what happens after the stock split, not much happens. But interestingly, when they broke their companies down to those that subsequently increased dividends and decreased dividends, they found that companies that increased dividends saw their stock prices continue to drift up after the split, and companies where dividends were cut saw their stock prices decrease. Their conclusion was, a hey, stock prices might be for the most part neutral events, but sometimes they can signal changes to come. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take stock splits and look for potential value effects pricing effects and gap effects. Let's start with the value effect. I think of myself as incredibly creative in coming up with value consequences for pretty much any action, but I'm hard pressed to find a value effect from a stock split. In fact, the analogy I would give for a stock split is imagine going into your favorite pizza store, ordering your favorite pizza, cutting it into six pieces. And then you proceed to cut each piece into two pieces, making them 12 pieces. Let me ask you a question. Do you have more pizza just because you cut your pizza into 12 pieces instead of six? Absolutely not. Does the pizza taste better? It shouldn't. It's the same pizza. A stock split is the ultimate cosmetic action. All you've changed is the number of shares. And because you've changed the number of shares, your share price should change, but the value hasn't changed. In fact, you could argue that Tesla and Apple haven't become, in fact, there's, it, it's really not even, you don't even need an argument. It's almost a given that Tesla and Apple cannot become more valuable just because of the stock splits, because nothing fundamental changes those two companies. Now, if you think about, uh, you know, about Apple, a few weeks ago, I said I owned Apple. And at that time, I said, I'm going to sell Apple at about $500 per share. If I'd continue to own Apple on August 31st at $500 per share, after the stock split, the stock price would have been 125. But if I thought it was overvalued at 500, I'm going to continue to believe it's overvalued 125. Both the price and the value will drop by one uh, to one fourth of what they were before the stock split. It was a four for one stock split. So I can't even imagine what the value story would be for stock splits. Could there be a gap story? Yes. If your company is lightly fallen, people don't notice it, and it feels it's undervalued. In other words, the price is lower than the value. A stock split can be a way in which you can draw attention to yourself because when you split your stock, people notice. And maybe that attention will cause the gap to close. So with companies that are lightly followed, where there's little attention paid to the company, you can make the argument that a stock split could have a gap effect. Now, making this argument with Apple and Tesla is very difficult to do. These are among two of the most widely followed companies in the world. In fact, Tesla has never had trouble attracting attention 
it's difficult for me to visualize that a stock split is what's motivating, that these companies are motivated by drawing attention to themselves when they did the stock splits. But for some companies, it might make sense. For instance, a few, a few weeks ago, a company called Martin Transport, I see you've never heard of the company, announced a three for two stock split. Now, when it did announce a stock split, there was a new story in the Wall Street Journal and its stock price went up after the stock split. For a company like Martin Transport, which is below, which is under the radar, a stock split might draw attention. Finally, could there be a pricing effect? Yes. In fact, there are two arguments made for why stock splits could have a pricing effect. The first is that maybe the stock split can reduce transactions, cause increased liquidity. Why is this going to happen? Well, you'd have to stretch, but you have to get there to the argument that when you have a stock split and the price and the price goes to a range that investors are more willing to trade, maybe liquidity will go up. Well, this should show up in higher trading volume and lower bid ask spreads. Another argument that can be made for liquidity is maybe if a share is, a company's shares are trading at too high a price, $1,000 per share, $10,000 per share, there are people who are going to be shut out. And to the extent that having a stock split makes the shares more affordable to more investors, maybe the demand will increase and liquidity will go up. So one argument for stock splits, but it's a testable argument, is that liquidity goes up, bid ask spreads go down, and maybe that's the reason stock splits have an effect on the price. The second argument is a momentum argument, which is, remember stock splits follow periods where the stock price has been going up and up and up. And a stock split might keep that process going. And the reason actually is a behavioral one. I mean, I bought Apple shares at $75 per share and I watched it go to 500. And whatever I think about the value, that's a lot of price appreciation in a relatively small time period. And let's say I'm getting more and more anxious about how much the company has gone up in such a short time period. And then Apple announces a stock split. Now, what I'm going to say next is going to make absolutely no sense from a rational perspective, but hang in there. After the stock split, the 4 for 1 stock split, let's say Apple goes to $125 a share. Now, if I'm rational, you know what I should be doing, right? I should be taking the $75 I paid before and dividing it by 4 to come up with a, with a price that I paid of $18.75. But let's say psychologically, I continue to compare the $125 that I'm, that the price is, not to the 1875, which is one fourth of 75, but to $75. You think that makes no sense? The essence of behavioral arguments is we have framing issues, the way we think about numbers. Maybe by reducing the price per share, the momentum can keep going. So that's the stock split story. And I'll be quite honest with Apple and Tesla. I think I can't see a value effect I don't see how increased attention is the reason for the split. Liquidity, I mean, these, stock, these companies are already incredibly liquid. Maybe there'll be some new investors that come into the stock, but I, may, I see it very difficult to justify that argument. It seems primarily a momentum effect. And we're going to see, be able to see the data to see if that's in fact true. Let's move on to index inclusions and exclusions. Remember when a stock is included in an index, there are messages that are sent out. Let's take the S&P 500, the most widely followed and tracked index in the world. When a company is added to the S&P 500, here's the simplest and most direct message. This is now a large company. Why? Because one of the requirements to be in the S&P 500 is to have, you, have to be, is to, you have to have enough of a market cap to make it to that list of 500 companies. You think, so what? For better or worse, we tend to think of large companies as safer and more secure. So maybe that's the first message you get. But if it was just market cap, Tesla should already be in the S&P 500, right? You know why it's not there? Because it hasn't reported four consecutive quarters, or, or at least based on gap earnings, positive earnings over a four quarter period. That's going to come sooner or later. But to the extent that that happens and it gets listed, that signal gets sent out as well. This company is now a money ma money making company. So when you look at the evidence on, on companies being included in index, much of the evidence is built around the S&P 500, not surprisingly. And what the evidence finds, at least on a consensus basis, is when a company is added to the S&P 500, its stock price tends to go up. 
And when it's removed, the stock price tends to go down and the change tends to be permanent. There are two caveats I would add to these findings. The first is that when you look at the kinds of companies that get added to the index, they often tend to get added because their stock price and earnings and market cap have increased in the recent past. This is selection bias. In fact, one interesting study that, uh, that I've linked to here you now looked at match, a match sample. Basically, they took the companies were added to the index and then they matched these companies with other companies with similar characteristics. Older also had an increase in earnings and market cap, which were not added to the index. And this match sample, they discovered that there was no index addition effect. So maybe what we're calling an index addition effect might in fact be a reflection of the kinds of companies that get added to the index. The second, the second view, and this is only, there's only some paltry evidence backing this up, is there's some evidence that the effect of being included in the S&P 500 is getting smaller over time rather than bigger. Like this study that, I, that I've that i linked to found that the index effect was greatest in the 1990s and has decreased over time. In addition, when um, studies look at what happens when a company gets added to an index, they find that its stock tends to get a little more volatile and that it tends to move more with the index, almost a given now that you're part of the index. So there are some real changes that happen. So let's take index inclusions and exclusions through the three tests. Is it a value effect? Is it a gap effect? Is it a pricing effect? Could there be a value effect from including a company in an index? At first sight, you're saying, what value effect? I mean, the company is still the same company. There is one argument and it's one pathway to connect index inclusion to value, but it's, it's a, I have to warn you that you've got to reach to, to even see this pathway. It is true that when you get listed in the S&P 500 index, the types of investors who hold your stock change. They become more institutional and they tend to become more passive. So when you are listed in the S&P 500, your in investor base can become different. And there's actually a study that finds, and this is a fairly recent one, that with that change in investor base come changes to the company. The company starts to behave more like its peer group in terms of how much dividends it pays and how many, you know, how much it can, uh, how much it buys, you know, how many shares it buys back. So by behave, by getting listed in the index, you might change a company's investing, financing, and dividend behavior. And when you do that, you could affect value. In fact, this paper came to the conclusion that being included in the index would have a value effect, but the value effect was more likely to be negative than positive. So could index inclusions and exclusions affect your value? Yes, but you've got to kind of reach. Could index inclusions and exclusions affect the gap between price and value? Again, at first sight, it's tough to justify. After all, there is no index that looks at you know, whether a company is under or overvalued as a factor in whether to include in the index. You know, so the, 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 the committee that decides what companies to include in the S&P 500, don't, you know, that committee doesn't value these companies and see if they're under or overvalued. That said, though, when a company gets added to an index, it gets attention, it gets noticed. And maybe if the company was already undervalued, that, that notice might lead the pricing gap to change. However, there are some contrarians who view the effect of inclusion in index as a negative, and here's why. Remember, to be included in the index, you've got to have a long period where prices have gone up, your market cap has increased, and if you're a contrarian, your argument might be that if your price has gone up and your market cap has gone up so much to be included in the index, maybe you're overpriced, more likely to be overpriced than underpriced. But again, you can see it's a bit of a stretch. Which brings me to the third effect, the pricing effect. You know, clearly you increase, change the investor base. Presumably for some companies being included in the index will draw on investors into the company who otherwise would not have invested in the company. To begin with, think of all those index funds that are indexed to the S&P 500. They now have to hold your shares. You could tell a very facile story where being listed in the index now increases your demand for your shares, which pushes up the price. But the question of whether that will play out will depend both on the company you're talking about in the index in question. For instance, you now I started this session by talking about the Dow 30. The Dow 30 might be a widely reported index, but it's not a widely tracked index. Now, to be quite honest, I know of no index fund built around the Dow 30. There might be some, but they're not high profile funds. So I don't think being listed on the Dow 30 or being removed is going to have a significant effect. 
Well, I could be proved wrong. You can go and check to see what happened to the three stocks included and excluded yesterday, but I don't see the effect. In contrast, though, a few months ago, last year, ServiceNow, a company you probably haven't heard of, was added to the S&P 500. Its stock price climbed. Low profile company joins the most highly tracked index in the world. There could be an index inclusion effect that comes from new investors coming to the company. Now with Apple and Tesla, you can see already that making that argument, with, with Tesla especially, making that argument that when it enters the S&P 500, there's going to be a big effect on its price. Why? I mean, and let's face it, you know, Tesla has no shortage of investors. It is entirely possible, in fact, that if Tesla enters the S&P 500, the investors who will buy shares are not the investors that Tesla wants. Tesla's bull run has been driven by individual investors who have absolute faith in the company, who believe in the company. Do you really want index funds and institutional investors being your primary investors? Maybe being in, included in the S&P 500 will be a bad thing for Tesla, not good. I'm, I'm not making a prediction of doom, but I'm, you can already see that whether being included in the index is a good or bad will depend on the company and the index. So here's the bottom line. What does this all mean for you? If you're an investor, nothing that happened yesterday on August 31st should change your views on the companies that are involved. If you believe Tesla and Apple were overvalued coming into August 31st, they'll still be overvalued. If you believe they're undervalued, they'll still be undervalued. If you believe that one or both of these stocks is, is under overvalued though, and you're hoping that these stock splits will cause the gap to, uh, to close, again, my question is why? I mean, these are already the most tracked, most followed companies in the world. The split is not the attention is not going to change what people think about the company. And finally, if you're a trader, there is a game being played and this is your time for maximum pain or maximum gain. The positive story you can tell is this stock split will keep the momentum. That's been, I mean, incredibly strong for these two companies going and they will continue to go up. You can play the momentum game and ride the stock more. The problem with the momentum game though, is it's fickle. Nobody knows what causes momentum to shift. What if people were expecting a big payday, traders were expecting a big trade day, tra payday from stock splits and it doesn't manifest itself over the next two weeks? Will that disappointment be enough to change momentum? I don't know. So it is entirely possible as a trader that you could play this game for, for gain or for pain. Now it looks like I'm trying to have it both ways and I am. And that's one good reason why I'm not a trader. But I'm not trying to tell you that splits don't matter and index inclusions don't matter. I'm saying that much of what you read as explanation for what these events should do to companies kind of misses the point. You know, step back and make your own judgment on what the value effects, the pricing effects and the gap effects are going to be for these events and don't stop there. For the next few weeks, every time you see an event on a company, think about this framework and think about what is the effect on value? What is the effect on price? What does this do to the gap? It's a much healthier way of assessing corporate events and how they play out in the market. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you found the session useful.